Good morning, Richfield Church of Christ. I hope that you are well today. Thank you for joining me, uh, whether you're a guest or a member of our local church, for this time of worship, of spending time in God's word, in prayer, and in taking communion together. I hope that you are well today. I hope that you are going to have a Merry Christmas with your family and friends. I uh, hope that you are safe as you travel. I know some of you will be traveling out of state or to different places uh, to be with family, and I pray that you are blessed in that. Well, today we're going to continue to look at these stories from the Gospel of Matthew uh, that take place in the early life of Jesus. And what we've been seeing is that the, the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew, as he writes his Gospel, is giving us these stories, genealogies, uh, things about Jesus' life when he was very young to help us understand who Jesus is and what he came to do. Uh, who is this person who is the Son of God? Son of Man, the, the Son of Abraham, the Son of David, uh, who is God in the flesh here with us. Who is this Jesus, which his name we saw last week means Yahweh saves, who has come to save his people and to save the nations that would trust in him. And so as we read this story, uh, we are thankful that what God is doing for us is he's communicating who Jesus is and what he's come to do for the whole world. Now, the, the problem when we come to these stories, and we addressed this a little last week, is that when we come to them, that they are often so wrapped in uh, our familiarness with them, uh, that we, because of uh, stories that we heard growing up as children, uh, maybe you grew up seeing plays about these stories, maybe you've watched movies that depict these things, or you've read Christmas cards, is that every single one of us, I think, for the most part, brings some baggage to these stories that is not actually a part of the text, that, that's not really in the story, and it may even uh, distort or uh, keep us from seeing the bigger, more important points that God is trying to make for us through the story. And we may fail to grasp just how incredible they are. I want you to consider as we read this text in Matthew 2, 1 through 12, what it would be like to be any of the characters in this story, uh, to be Joseph or Mary, the mother and father of this new baby whose lives are suddenly in danger because their little child is a threat to a king who wants to protect his power. I want you to consider what it be, would be like to be one of these magi, these astrologers, these wise men from the East who have come longing to meet and worship, to honor the Messiah, the King of the Jews, who God's people have been waiting for, and that they are Gentiles coming to worship. And look at what they do in response to Jesus. Uh, you know, to consider how Herod is representative of so many of the powers of this world opposed to God and God's kingdom coming and how the powers of this world will do anything to oppose uh, another king and to work against God's kingdom coming uh, in this world. And so put yourself in the shoes of the different characters of the stories. Maybe even consider what it's like to, to be in this story, a religious leader who misses out, a person who should have known God, who misses out, on the Messiah's coming. All of these characters have something for us to think about. The questions of who is the good news for? Where do we find the real king? How do we find the real king? And how do we respond to the truth that Jesus is the true king of God's people? And so let's read the story together and just reflect with me uh, as we read it. Matthew chapter 2 verses 1 through 12. Now after Jesus was born, in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, in Bethlehem of Judea. For so it is written by the prophet, And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. 
And after listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshiped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. So what this story, I think, presents to us is that God is inviting peoples of every tribe and nation, uh, both Jew and Gentile, to come and worship Jesus, the King. And that to offer Jesus worship is a costly thing. We're to offer Jesus worship that costs uh, more than just our, our stuff. Or it's, it's an offering of our whole lives. But that the text reminds us that Jesus is worth the cost. Uh, he is worth our entire being. Uh, everything we have to offer uh, should be given to him in worship. And so let's look at this text and, and walk through the characters and see what's unfolding in this story. You know, when the foreign wise men, or in the text, what it literally says uh, in the Greek is magoi, uh, or magi is how we typically refer to it. Uh, these men come to Herod's palace, this group of people. They come to Herod's palace in Jerusalem, and they ask what would have been a very disturbing question. Where is the king, the one born king of the Jews, so that we may, may worship him? Uh, and what they're doing is they're asking what is a political and a controversial question. Uh, you, you don't go and ask the current king, where is the real king? <laughs> you know, you, you're not the real deal. Can you point us to where he is? Now, the reason they would have gone to the king's palace in Jerusalem uh, looking for the king is that you assume in some cases uh, that if a king, new king's been born, surely he's in the current king's palace. And so when he asked, when they asked this question, they are asking a despot, a horrible king who would do anything to protect his power, uh, a troubling question. What we know about Herod is that Herod the Great was a uh, illegitimate king. Uh, you can find all this information about him, but let me just give you a summary of who he was, is that he was an illegitimate king. Uh, he was king of Israel because Rome had placed him in power and was the, that Rome was truly the ones running the place. Herod was born in 73 BC. Uh, he became king of Judea in 40 BC. The Roman Senate put him in power. And by 37 BC, he had destroyed all rivals to his throne. And so he was the son of an Idumean named Antipater. He was wealthy. He was politically gifted. Uh, he was an excellent administrator. He was clever enough to know how to remain in Rome's good graces. Uh, and so what, what we know about Herod is he was a ruthless ruler uh, who did some good things for Israel, but overall was a terrible person and did terrible things to rivals, to family, to friends, uh, in, all in order to protect his power. What we know is it says that he's an Idumean. Uh, which is a, another way of saying an Edomite, uh, which makes him a descendant of Esau, the son of Isaac and the brother of Jacob, who later was renamed Israel. And so in the Genesis story, in Genesis 25, when we read about the birthing of uh, Jacob and Esau, we find out that in Rebekah's womb, there are these twin boys. And in the womb, these two boys are fighting. And she finds out the reason that they're fighting even in her womb is that they are two nations and that two peoples will come from them and that one people will be stronger than the other. The older will serve the younger, Genesis 25, 23. And so even from the womb, we learn that the Esau, his descendants, his people will become servants to Jacob, to Israel. And so we see this play out in the story of Esau is that Esau, uh, in a moment of foolishness and hunger, sells his birthright to his brother Jacob for a play, uh, bowl of lentil stew. Uh, and then later, Jacob and his mother, using trickery, using deception, uh, Jacob receives the blessing from Isaac, his father, that was intended for his brother Esau. And then over the course of the history of Jacob's descendants, the Israelites, and the descendants of Esau, the Edomites, we find that this is a relationship uh, consumed with rivalry, with bitterness, that Edom is an enemy of Israel during the story of Scripture. They were never strong enough to fight Judah in war or to conquer or rule over Judah. 
uh, but they would sometimes raid Israel and their villages. Uh, they celebrated when Nebuchadnezzar destroyed Jerusalem and the temple and the walls and took away uh, Judah into exile. And the book of Obadiah talks about how God's justice would come on Edom uh, because they had celebrated the downfall of God's people. And so they were eventually displaced to a region known as Idumea. They were forced to convert to Judaism. Uh, and now, after hundreds of years, they celebrate the irony, that the reality, that now Herod, one of their own, one of their Idumean brothers, Edomites, has become ruler, a false king over Israel. And so sadly, when Jesus is born into the world, Edom rules over Jacob. Esau <laughs> rules over Jacob through Herod. Uh, this illegitimate king. And so this is why Jesus is a threat to Herod. It's a story about two kingdoms colliding and going to war. It's a story about the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God coming on earth uh, as it is in heaven and the reign of God overcoming the rule of evil and wicked kings. And so it's Herod against Joseph, Mary, and Jesus. And he understands that this story, this birth of this king of the Jews, is a story about who will be king. And so what we know is he was a ruthless man. He killed his foes. He killed his friends. He killed his wife. He killed his sons to protect his rule. And we know that he died uh, in 4 BC. And this means for us that uh, even though we've typically, you may have grown up thinking uh, that Jesus was born in 0, zero uh, CE or AD. Uh, in fact, what we know to be true is that Jesus was probably born at, at the earliest in 6 BC, because Herod dies in 4 BC. And so, uh, and we know that he attempts to have uh, all the two-year-olds uh, and under in the city of Bethlehem killed uh, in order to try and take Jesus out. We'll see that story next week, but just, just to help us know when these things are happening. But what we do, do know is that uh, the reason that Herod is threatened is that a group of, of people have come to him from the east searching for this king. This is what brings it to his attention, right? Is that there are these magi. It's the word from which we get uh, our word magic or magician. Uh, but what they would have been is that these magi would have been wise men. They would have been astrologers. They're students who looked at the skies to study the stars and the planets and the movement of heavenly bodies to try and understand how these things uh, affected what was going on on the earth where they lived. And so they were interested in dreams and astrology and in magic and in books with mysterious references to the future. Uh, so, for example, in the Old Testament, when you read in the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 2, uh, verses 1 through 12, uses this same uh, Greek word in the Septuagint uh, to refer to the king's servants uh, who were called to try and interpret the dreams, that, the visions that he was having. And so uh, what we know is that in the ancient world, it was, it was common for there to be people who studied the stars and the planets. You know, in a world without electric lights, the way we experience it is that the stars are incredibly bright. You can see so much more of the heavens, the skies, uh, than we so often are able to see now, uh, as we especially, for us living in the cities of Minneapolis, St. Paul, and the surrounding areas, that uh, it's harder for us to see all the stars and the incredible beauty of the heavens. And so they knew that when an event in their minds, when an event happened in the skies with the stars and the planets, that something incredible, something important was also happening on earth. Now, when we read about this group of magi, uh, here's to clear up a few of the misconceptions about this story, is that so many people, when they hear about these wise men, magi, astrologers, they assume there are three. Uh, you know, there's the, the classic song, We Three Kings of Orient Are. Well, uh, not to hurt your feelings, but that song is a misrepresentation of what the Bible actually says. Uh, they, we don't think they were kings. Uh, we don't know how many of them there were. There were likely, I would guess, more than three, but I think the assumption that there are three is that there are three gifts given in the story later. Uh, but it's very likely that this was probably a larger group of men uh, in order for them to create the kind of uproar by coming into the king's palace uh, and causing the king and the city to be afraid. I think this is a more significant group than just three guys. Uh, what we also know is that likely this group of, of magi, this group of wise men, is that they were likely royal servants to kings living in the east. Uh, what do we know also? They, they are probably from the region of Babylon uh, or Persia. 
Uh, they have traveled from the east. They have come a long distance. In some ways, they're probably familiar with some of Israel's scriptures. One of the, the things that happened because of the exiles to Assyria and Babylon and because of the, the Roman world, the way it worked, is that the Jewish people had been dispersed all over this region, all over this part of the world, so that it would not be surprising that these Magi, these Gentile astrologers, would have come in contact with the Jewish people, had, would have come in contact with the scriptures that would have pointed them toward waiting and watching for a star that would rise that would reveal the Messiah or the King of the Jews. We know that they have to be wealthy, right? To, to make this kind of a large journey, you have to have the means to pick up and leave home for a long time, and that they bring Jesus gifts worthy of a king to show him honor. And in all this story, what, what we need to remember is, is that God has prepared a way for the Gentiles to come to know and worship Jesus the King. That God has prepared the way for hundreds of years uh, through the development of roads and connections, uh, through the dispersing of his people and the scriptures to places far away from Israel, that God is preparing the way for the Gentiles to come to worship and love and obey Jesus the King. You know, we're told that they saw the star that rose in the east, and they follow this star uh, to where the king of the Jews has been, and they've come to worship. And well, what is the star? You may wonder, and a lot of people speculate. The text doesn't really tell us whether this is an actual heavenly star, like a physical star that's being moved, or a supernova, or any number of things. Uh, there's, there's possibly reason to believe that this could be an angel an angelic messenger in the form of a bright light of star, because what the star does is interesting is that it, uh, it moves, it guides them, it stops over the house, the place where uh, Jesus and his family lived, and there is some associations between angels and stars in the Old Testament. We won't go into that, but if you're interested, I can give you the verses at another time. But either way, this idea of following a star to the location of the Messiah points back to an Old Testament passage, an Old Testament story about a character named Balak and another character named Balaam, that in the book of Numbers, when God's people were on the move, it, Numbers tells us the story of the journey of God's people from Mount Sinai to the very edge of the promised land and how God goes with them and blesses and protects his people on the journey, is that in the story, uh, the king of Moab, a man named Balak, becomes afraid of Israel. And he decides that in order to try to stop Israel, uh, that he would hire a, uh, in a sense, a magician, a wise man, uh, a man who had powers, uh, a seer, to curse Israel. And he believes that if he can curse Israel, uh, then he will be protected from them uh, destroying him or taking his land, his people, his country. And so Balaam summoned uh, Balak summoned Balaam, excuse me, to curse Israel, but, but God only allows Balaam to bless Israel again and again and again. And Balaam blessed Israel three times, and on his final oracle of blessing in Numbers 24, 15 to 18, we read, the oracle of Balaam, the son of Beor, the oracle of the man whose eye is open, the oracle of him who hears the words of God and knows the knowledge of the Most High who sees the vision of the Almighty falling down with his eyes uncovered. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. It shall crush the forehead of Moab and break down all the sons of Sheth. Edom shall be dispossessed. Seir also, his enemies, shall be dis dispossessed. Israel is doing valiantly. And so it's very likely that, the pro that these men, these magi, were familiar with this prophecy because the king who is associated with the star will deliver the people of God from their enemies, including false kings like Herod, uh, who are who is of the Edomites, which is <laughs> talked about in this passage from Numbers. And so we have a man from the east prophesying about a star and the king of the Jews. And in Matthew, we have Magi from the east following a star to come and find the king of the Jews. You know, Isaiah the prophet talks about in a number of texts the reality of the coming Messiah. And when the Messiah comes, that the nations will be drawn to light, uh, to his light, to the light of God's salvation. And that these nations, uh, you could read Isaiah 60, 1 through 6, that these nations would bring riches and gifts of worship to offer to God's king. And so we see in Matthew, Matthew showing us these things happening, that the nations are being drawn to the light of God's son, and that they have come to offer him worship. But Jesus is not just here to save Jews. 
Jesus is not just here for the people of Israel, but that Jesus has come to be a savior, to be a king for all peoples. Well, when Herod hears this and he is threatened, he begins to uh, get upset. And all of Jerusalem is concerned and worried. They know about the Magi's coming. They know what the Magi have asked the king. They know that Herod is upset and he wants to fix this, to get rid of this boy uh, before he is threatened. And so Herod, what is he going to do? He's going to assemble all the religious people who could tell him, where can I find this king of the Jews? So he brings the chief priests, the scribes, or the uh, teachers of the law into his royal court. And what we know about these people is the chief priests are the leaders responsible for the worship of Israel, for the temple functions and activities. And what we know about them is that they, uh, they were a group of corrupt religious leaders, not all of them, but the majority, many of them, uh, were oriented toward politics, towards uh, preserving an alliance with Rome that allowed them to maintain their power, uh, their influence among the people of Israel. And then the, uh, the teachers of the law, the scribes, as it's often uh, translated, are those who were given the responsibility of interpreting the law of the Torah for the people of God and teaching them how they were to live it. And so Herod asked these groups of religious leaders, where is the Messiah to be born? And uh, amazingly, they do know the scripture well enough to be able to say, we know that the Messiah is going to be born in Bethlehem, in Bethlehem of Judea. And what's amazing, though, is that even though they know the answer to the question of where the Messiah was going to be born, uh, they are indifferent to Jesus the Messiah. They don't really care about going and finding him themselves. Uh, they've spent their whole lives studying the scriptures, the Hebrew Bible, to know about what God is doing in the world and when the Messiah would come to deliver them. They've been spent their whole life in hope for a better future. But when they actually hear that the Messiah maybe has come, they ignore him. Knowledge of scripture is not enough in and of itself, right? I, I, I want to know the Bible and I want other people to learn scripture. But this text reminds us that you can know the Bible and you can still miss what God is doing. You can still uh, not live according to the will of God. You can know the, the Bible and still live in rebellion to what God is saying through his word. And so they knew the Messiah's birthplace would be in Bethlehem, but they did nothing about it. Uh, they were indifferent to Jesus. And eventually the story of, of the Gospels will show us that it was the religious leaders who opposed and had Jesus killed uh, on a Roman crucifix. And so uh, what this reminds us of is that our knowledge, our reading, our knowing of Scripture ought to lead us to devotion to Jesus, to love of him, to worship and obedience to his will for us. And in contrast to these religious figures who are Jewish religious figures, we are given the picture of Gentile astrologers, magi, wise men who would have known far less of the Hebrew scriptures. And yet they were willing to travel hundreds of miles to find and offer costly worship to Jesus, the Messiah. And so these Jewish religious leaders are, are unwilling to walk six miles from Jerusalem to Bethlehem to see if the Messiah really has come. And so Jesus, who is born the Messiah, uh, their quotation comes from Micah chapter five, verse two. And it also is a reference back to the story of second Samuel five, verse two, the Bethlehem of Judah is the place where King David was born. Uh, it's where he grew up. And now it's the place where Jesus, the Messiah is born. And that the, what, what the Messiah will do is he will be a king, a shepherd like David. You will shepherd my people Israel and be ruler over Israel. This picture continues throughout the Old Testament. The Messiah that would come would be a shepherd king who would care for and deliver and protect God's people. And so in Micah 5, when Micah the prophet is speaking these words, he's speaking uh, with the Assyrian threat of exile hanging over the people of God. And Micah prophesies and promises that one day, there would be a king who would shepherd God's people. And that king uh, would be born in Bethlehem of Judea. That king would bring peace, security, deliverance, and restoration from exile. And so Jesus, the text is reminding us, is this shepherd king who fulfills the hopes of his people, longing for a king who would care for them, who would uh, take the scattered sheep and bring them back into the fold, into relationship with God the Father. So Herod makes an evil plan. Herod 
uh, schemes and he pretends to this group of magi that he also wants to worship Jesus and says, why don't you go find him for me and then come back and tell me where he is so that I can go and worship him. We know what Herod really wants to do is murder Jesus, get him out of the way. And so the star appears again and leads the wise men to Jesus. And the text so beautifully I just love this phrase of, of their response to finding Jesus. And, and is our response to finding and knowing Jesus similar is what I would, would ask is that they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. They were so excited. They were over the top excited. They were uh, joyfully joyful, <laughs> however you want to say it. Uh, this was a moment for them that, that they had been waiting for for months uh, of travel as they had longed to find this Messiah. And so they go to Bethlehem and they find the star stops over the house where Jesus uh, and Joseph and Mary would have been living. Now, this is also the issue that sometimes happens when you see nativity scenes is that often nativity scenes uh, picture uh, Joseph and Mary with baby Jesus in a manger and with the wise men to the side uh, worshiping and offering their gifts. Well, clearly, uh, now at this point in the story, Joseph and Mary and Jesus are living in a house. Uh, a number of months and possibly even over a year has passed since the actual birth of Jesus uh, when they come to worship him. And so we could imagine that Jesus is somewhere between a few months old and two years old. Why? Because Herod will later kill all the males two years and under in order to try and wipe out Jesus uh, in, the, in the town of Bethlehem. And when they come to him, they fall to their knees and worship him. I, I, I would maybe bow down uh, just to, to help us visualize that, but then you wouldn't see me <laughs> in the video. But just think about this as they bow down, they prostrate themselves before King Jesus, this infant, this uh, young child. They bow themselves before him, which is an act of worship. And you only bow down to someone that you view as superior to you. Uh, this is what they are doing in their worship, and they offer him these extravagant, extravagant gifts of gold, uh, of frankincense, and of myrrh, and there's some argument that each of these things uh, connect with some aspect of who Jesus is, uh, his royalty, uh, his deity, uh, his uh, coming death, uh, that when Jesus is hanging from the cross, he'll be offered wine mixed with myrrh, uh, that he will be off, he will in his burial uh, by Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea, they will use myrrh to prepare Jesus' body for burial. Uh, there, you could look some of those things up yourself, but either way, the, the image is these are gifts worthy of a king, worthy of the Messiah. And just like these wise men, here's where we need to finish. Here's where we need to begin to take the text and live it with our own lives, is that God is calling all people to worship and honor Christ. That God is drawing the nations to himself to worship King Jesus. And that Jesus is the one who's fulfilling the promises made to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and all of his, all of his people throughout history in every covenant. That God would bless the nations through the coming of Jesus, the Son. And so if, if we know that we found King Jesus and that he is the hope of the world, he is Yahweh's salvation, God in the flesh come for us, the only true response we should be offering is worship to offer our lives to him, to bow down before Christ. Uh, and, and that means not just physically, although that can be a helpful practice for us acknowledging the reality of God's greatness and the kingship of Jesus is maybe the next time you pray, you might actually kneel and bow down and prostrate yourself before God, recognizing that he is worthy of our worship for what he has done and Christ is worthy of our worship. But even more than offering gifts, uh, whether they be physical gifts or monetary gifts or gifts of time, uh, what we know is that it costs us a lot to worship Jesus. The worship of Jesus in this world is costly. Well, why is that? It's because this text shows us that if you are going to worship Jesus, it will cost you the favor of the powers of this world, uh, that they, they desire to rule over us, to have our allegiance, to have our favor, to have our minds and our hearts be formed according to whatever it is that they want for us. The, the rulers, the authorities, the powers of this world, the spiritual forces of darkness want us to kneel in worship to them and allow our lives to be molded by what they believe and value and practice in rebellion against the true God and his kingdom. And so if you are going to bow down to King Jesus and offer him your allegiance, your worship, your very life, what we have to accept is that it will cost us something. And it is a declaration that to bow down and worship King Jesus, what we do, whether we do it online or we, when we gather in person, is we are making a declaration 
of whose side we are on. We are saying who it is we are living for, who it is that, that leads us, who it is that guides us in what we decide to do with our lives, with our bodies, with our work, with our entertainment, with our mind, with every part of who we are. We are making a statement that is a statement of spiritual warfare every time we worship King Jesus rather than worshiping the powers of this world. And so let me invite you to recognize that the word, if you're going to truly worship Jesus, it will cost you something but it is worth the cost. You know, God wants every one of us to give our lives, our every day in worship of Jesus so that the world might know that he is God and King, that he has come to save us, to restore us to God, and to give us a resurrection life in the present and in the future. And Isaiah, uh, who so often gives us these beautiful texts that points us to the Messiah, says about the Christ that he will be a light for the Gentiles so that God's salvation may reach to the ends of the earth, and that nations will come to your light and kings to the brightness of your dawn, is that when we worship Jesus and when we proclaim the gospel to all the world, we are inviting the whole world, both Jew and Gentile, to come and worship King Jesus and acknowledging that he reigns. So the Lord reigns. Let us rejoice. Come and worship King Jesus. Let's take communion together as we pray this morning. Would you pray with me for the bread? God, we thank you for King Jesus, the true and living King, the one who has all power and authority. And we pray that we would bow our lives before him and offer him worship that is costly. Father, that we would be willing to sacrifice uh, anything, even our own lives, to follow and serve Jesus the King. Thank you, Father God, that in this story you are with him, you were with Joseph and Mary, you were with these wise astrologers, these men coming from the east longing to worship and serve Jesus, and that you, in the midst of these challenging and difficult circumstances, you protected King Jesus, uh, and you defeated uh, the work of Herod. Uh, Father, we know that you are with us in the midst of the grief and the pain of this world. We know that you are delivering us through the the death and the resurrection of Jesus, your son. And we pray that as we worship him today, uh, we would remember what he has done for us in his cross. Uh, bless us now as we break bread together. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. And then let's pray for the cup. God, we thank you for the precious blood of Jesus. Lord Jesus, you are worthy of our honor, our worship. Uh, our whole lives. We pray now as we drink this cup and you are present with us, we pray, King Jesus, that you would help us to willingly follow you, uh, to offer our lives as living sacrifices and to be willing to pay any cost in order to be faithful to you and your kingdom. Lord, bless us now as we drink the cup as your people. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Let me say again, thank you for being with me. I pray that as you go out, that this week, uh, in what you do and in what you say, uh, in, in what we think and how we live, as we spend time with family and friends, uh, it is a time for us to worship and bow before Jesus. It's a time for us to reflect his glory in our lives and in all that we do. And I, I just hope that you are blessed uh, in this Christmas season and that you are blessed as you are uh, with God and with your family and whatever you're doing. Thank you for joining me today. Uh, I pro pray for you uh, and hope that you are well. Thanks.